Good morning. This is Natalie Gilly with the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Welcome to the webinar for the Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Network. We are going to be talking about how to be a problem solver and moving from advocacy to action today. You should see on your screen the first slide that uh, welcomes you to the webinar here with that title showing on your screen. And the community we'll spotlight today is going to be White Bear Lake. So as you know, every month when we hold these webinars for the uh, statewide leaders for biking and walking, we rotate the community spotlight around the state. So uh, if you're unfamiliar, White Bear Lake is located just north of the metro. And um, we look forward to hearing from um, Michael Brooks, who's a local uh, and is gonna share a little bit about that story today. So just to start out, we do our introductions through the chat box. And if you'd like to put your name in the chat box, your location, and then here's the icebreaker question of the day. Have you heard about the Minnesota Bike Walk Summit? and bonus points if you're planning to attend. So this is uh, just kind of leading into the conversation today. If you'd like to put that information into the chat box, we can see who you are and where you're from. And we'll get a little bit more information to you during the webinar today to, to share with you um, some details. So uh, I see Barbara Beck from Rochester is on the line. Welcome to the webinar. Wayne Hurley, Fergus Falls, Ted from Minneapolis, Bob Dunn from Elgin, Mary Safgren from Randall, so people are jumping on here from across the state. So this is always wonderful to see a uh, representation from not only the metro area, but also uh, communities across the state of Minnesota. So to stay tuned for more details during this webinar on the uh, Minnesota Bike Walk Summit, save the date March 17th. The Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Network uh, has a purpose statement that we've created and that I like to share with the group when we hold these webinars. This group is um, intended for the purpose to connect local bike walk leaders to share stories and ideas about how they're lifting up the walking and biking culture in their communities. So let me um, go to the next slide here. The next slide here is the um, land acknowledgement and I'll go ahead and just read this. So this is something that we share during this webinar. We want to acknowledge that we occupy the ancestral lands of several indigenous groups, including the Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Cheyenne, Odo, Iowa, and Meskwaki people. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through the generations. We affirm that Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities. Despite centuries of colonial violence, this is still and always will be indigenous land. Indigenous people are still here demonstrating innumerable talents and gifts in the midst of continued oppression. They must be celebrated and uplifted. So you'll see at the bottom of the screen here, the, the link, if you'd like to go to that link and um, look to see what ancestral land you're located on. So coming up in 2021, we are on our second webinar of the year in uh, March. We'll meet on March 17th from 11.30 to 12.30 and in April on the 21st from 11.30 to 12.30. If you're not already a member of our listserv for the Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Network, you can join and we can get our emails and links to future webinars, information about things we share with this network. Uh, feel free to email me at natalie at bikemn.org if you'd like to join. And feel free to forward the emails that you receive for this webinar to other folks that are leaders across the state working with biking and walking. If you do want to invite someone else, they're, they're welcome to join. And as long as they have this link, they can join the webinar. One of the other leadership networks that happen here in Minnesota is the Safe Routes to School Network. So some of the folks on this webinar may be part of that network as well. So we do like to share the upcoming webinars happening for Safe Routes to School in case you'd like to join those as well. On March 11th from 10 to 11 a.m. Safe Routes to School Network will meet and they will be hosting the topic of using data, um, uses of the STEP score. So this is something that uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more, you can join that webinar. So this morning, we do want to welcome our first speaker. And we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the topic today will showcase and shine the spotlight on the community of White Bear Lake. 
So our first speaker today is going to be Michael Brooks. Michael Brooks is the Ramsey County Chair of the Lake Links Association, a White Bear Lake area nonprofit organized in 2017 to advance competition of the 10 mile trail route around White Bear Lake and other regional visions for safe walking and biking. Lake Links has worked closely with local communities, two counties, state agencies, and local legislators, resulting in close to $8 million in state-sponsored funding for their project. Mike has worked to advance safe biking and walking in White Bear Lake for 12 years. He was an advisor to the Ramsey County Pet and Bike Plan, White Bear Lake Safe Routes to School Committee, and numerous local planning groups and trail initiatives. He's an LCI, league cycling instructor, and completed his cycling savvy instructor training and certification in 2019. So lots of information there. We're very excited to have Michael Brooks as a speaker today on our panel. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, in that introduction, it took away about 90% of what I was going to say in this first slide. So I'm going to hack over some of it, but we're going to kind of go through it. But it's true. I am a co-chair of Lake Links. The other person who I share the chairship with is a man named Steve Wolgamet. He's the Washington County Chair. Uh, our mission here, the reason that we were um, organized in 2017 was to complete um, one, of, one of the routes on a uh, two, year 2000 plan, which is a safe way to get around White Bear Lake. Uh, it's a route, so there is some separated trails and there is some uh, uh, quiet streets on that. And we have been quite successful. I mean, Dorian can, can attribute this. I mean, when you've been together for uh, three years or so and you, you can raise something like $8 million, um, I think the things we're talking about today are, are kind of the uh, what we did to get to that point. Um, so uh, what I can do is let's go to the next slide <clears throat> and we'll get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the year 2000, the legislature had uh, spent $175,000 on a regional plan in our area that was known as the uh, Lake Links Trail Network Master Plan. Uh, Bike Men's own Dorian Grilly was the chair for the um, uh, residents or the community advisors. Uh, our angel in the Senate is a Senator Uyghur. Uh, he was on this too as a legislative um, liaison as was now Washington uh, Congressperson um, uh, Betty McCollum. And uh, so they looked at this and they threw a bunch of money at it and they said, well, how do we make this happen? Let me orientate you to this map a little bit and then you'll start to understand things just a bit better. That green line in the center that you see coming off from the base of the lake, Highway 12, um, when you take it to that mauve line, that mauve line is the gateway trail. Uh, there are some people in the community now, the Matamita Area Green Initiative is working with Washington County to make that road uh, much more bike and walk friendly. Uh, if you go up to the orange line that cuts across the top, the one that sneaks over to the mauve line, that one's not done yet, but go to the top of the lake. And that's another part of Highway 96. We're working on that one. And then you see where 96 kind of bumps into kind of a bluish line that slides along the side of the lake says Highway 244 corridor. We're working on that too, just past where that, see that little peninsula that sticks out into the lake along there. We got $3.6 million last year from the legislature to do those last two sections. On, <clears throat> excuse me, on the left side of the map, there's a line that comes in from the edge of the page. <clears throat> that's the other side of Highway 96, that's State Aid 96. And then when it crosses uh, into the lake, that's a regional trail, but it's locally uh, maintained by, by uh, White Bear Lake. So we had some of this done, but a, an awful lot of it wasn't done. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why that didn't happen and what we did to uh, get it to where it is today. Next slide, please. The thing that this plan represents is a uh, agreement by multiple communities, two counties, state agencies, that they wanna get this done. It's not what I would call simply a bike problem. Uh, it has connectivity issues. It has, if you're familiar with the RBTN, Regional Bike Transportation Network uh, coding that Met Council has, uh, there's a lot of reasons to do this, and uh, we find that if we just simply label our projects as 
bike trails or we got to have this bike you know path kind of a thing you know we're really cutting ourselves a little short we need to show the community that we're working on something broadly uh, that biking is a part of it biking can be a solution for a lot of local issues but <clears throat> it's not just a bike problem next slide please <clears throat> and when we're working with people uh, this is very important. Uh, you got to be hard on the problem and soft on the people. I can tell you that there's a, any number of rules, laws, statutes that say that, you know, bikes, bike paths and, and, and people who are non-motorized need to be included in the transportation system. If you go to MnDOT's uh, 17401, essentially their job description from the legislature, there's lots of listings as to what needs to happen. A, a lot of time it doesn't happen. And what we need to do is we need to work on the problem, but that doesn't mean pointing fingers and that doesn't mean making it difficult for people to work with you. This group here, uh, this picture was taken at the Matamidi City Hall. That's my co-chair in the center with the blue jacket and the, and the blue shirt. Uh, in front of him is Mayor Bob Newfort, uh, not currently the mayor of Delwood. And next to him is uh, Jed Marshall, who's the mayor of Matamidi. The rest of the people in here, what we're looking at on the table our plans that was created by an engineering firm named WSB. In 2017, we received some money uh, from the legislature to do what's called preliminary engineering, kind of scope out the problem. How much is it gonna cost? Where's the trail gonna go? And that's what we were talking about here. There's a lot of opinions that are flying around, but I can tell you in these meetings, everyone's focused on the problem and we're all trying to do the best job that we possibly can, um, but we're not, we're not pointing fingers, we're, we're, we're working with each other. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we've got a regional problem. Everyone agrees it's a regional problem. Um, we've gotten resolutions of support. We've gone around and got everybody on the page. We're building this base, this, this group to say, yeah, we really wanna do this. Yeah, that's great. How do we get this going? And then we say to ourselves, well, why didn't this happen before? This picture here is, uh, looks like an abandoned trail. I mean, abandoned rail section, doesn't it? But it's not. Uh, they actually, this gets used like, I don't know, an hour a year. Um, <laughs> and it should be the Bruce Vento Trail. If you know the Bruce Vento Trail, it comes up from uh, the city of St. Paul and it deads in at a road uh, called Berkeley Road, uh, just a little bit shy of White Bear Lake. And this is the section of that trail that would lead to Hoffman Road and would actually go up through White Bear Lake and it hasn't been done principally in this case because the railroad believes that the trail should be uh, 50 feet from the center line of the railroad. And when you have a couple hundred feet in a rail line, sometimes it's not real easy, uh, but you need to understand it. You need to understand uh, what's being done to, uh, to navigate this, how things work. Those agencies that are working with the rail line, what are they up against? How can you get around it? How can you get creative of it? And when it comes to research, um, it's all those things like that. In that map I showed you for uh, where we were working on 244, 21 years ago, uh, the reason that the trail didn't happen, a big part of it was because Mindai said, hey, there's no right of way. There's nothing here. Uh, we got together, my co-chair and I, we did research. We went back to 1949 and we found that when the county, uh, Washington County passed that road back to the uh, state, there was uh, at one end of the road, 66 feet of right of way at the other end, 35. So because of that research, we were able to put together a real argument uh, that, hey, yeah, we can get this trail done. The last part, persistence, you gotta have that in life anyway. But when you're an advocate, um, you're working at the speed of government and you gotta be ready to go at the speed of government and, and do what you can. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this, this slogan off to the right, or the left rather, um, was attributed to our angel, as I mentioned before, Chuck Weger, Senator Chuck Weger, uh, who's been a senator for quite some time. And he was asked in the paper, uh, Senator Weger, you know, what can we do to get our, uh, get our project noticed by the legislature to get funding? And his answer was, look, don't bring us a problem, bring us a solution to a problem. And that's kind of been our mantra at Lake Links. What we've done is we've tried very hard to do the background, the research, to talk to communities, to understand, you know, what is this? What do you want? What, why is this not happening? Who do we need to talk to? You want to do that. Uh, the document to the right is just one of the many documents that we sent 
to people of the legislature. Now, in the graphic originally, there was a kind of a condensed map of that around the lake portion of the, the original map we saw. We'd actually made puzzles out of that shrink wrap puzzles and we thanked legislators when you could go to the legislation, legis uh, to the Senate and the House and thank people in person and said, you know, hey, thanks for helping us solve our puzzle, our regional puzzle. So we try to mix it up, we try to stay in touch and we try to amass the information needed so that we're working for the legislator, he's not having to work for us. He's doing his work or she's doing her work in the halls, in the, in the chambers and, and that's where you need their help. Next slide. <clears throat> hey, it's Santa Claus. Um, pursue celebrity endorsements really means um, in your community, there are people who are, you could call them opinion leaders, you could call them, I don't know, they're just important people. They, they have a lot of sway. And if you can get them, uh, educate them about your project, get them on board, uh, everything else of that sort. Usually some of them don't work in government. You know, you've got people, We've got some people in White Bear Lake that are very influential and they're not in government. But you need to get those people on board, which means you got to broad base everything and figure it out. We got Santa Claus here because we wanted this picture to send back to the legislature about, hey, you know, is it going to be a good Christmas for the people around the lake? We tried all kinds of different things to try to move it up, shake it up and uh, do that. So if you can get the people on board, if you can understand from your communities, what their concerns are, um, what you need from them. Uh, why are we doing this? What are the benefits and everything else? Uh, prove that it's more than just a bike issue. It's a regional issue, it's a lifestyle issue. Uh, if you can pick through all of those things and you can get yourself then to the point where you, you're gonna go from where you're an advocate and you're gonna work through this uh, very complex layered of uh, communication with multiple people to get to the other end, which is getting uh, something in front of your legislator that uh, he or she can use to help you get the, the funding that you need for your project. Next slide. <clears throat> and so that's me, I'm Mike Brooks. And um, all of you who are advocates, kudos. It's very difficult work. It's uh, somewhat thankless work at times. You're not getting paid. and. A lot of times you don't get the recognition perhaps that you are owed. But if you can do these things, uh, the payback is enormous because you are giving back to your communities in ways uh, that few people do. And uh, I applaud anyone who puts out that level of effort. Um, after this, if you need to reach me, my email is at the bottom of the screen. Um, but I just kind of want to breeze through this. If there's time now for questions or something, Natalie, let's get to them. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for presenting this information and telling the story about White Bear Lake and the trail and the connection with the partners and funding and things like that, that definitely take a lot of time and effort to get to the point where you're at in White Bear Lake and always, you know, more work to be done as it were. So uh, we want to open it up for questions for, for Michael in the chat box. You'll see that Ted put Michael's email address there if you wanted a, a link to that to be able to send a message to him. But uh, we'll open it up for questions for a minute, few minutes here. Either type it in the chat box or unmute your line and feel free to jump in and ask your question. <clears throat> okay, so I've got one in front of me now. Uh, from Luke. Uh, thanks, Luke. Uh, the, the celebrity side of it is a big part of it. Maybe you can't get Santa on your team, but you know, what the heck, you know, do the best you can. And Luke is from Jackson, Minnesota, South Central. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, here, I got, I got to open up my chat box, it looks like. I didn't do that. <laughs> That's fine. We'll make sure that uh, we relay any of those. Um, okay. Oh my, I better make sure I go back to the screen that has your picture and not give anyone a sneak peek of anything we haven't covered yet. I don't Don't be, don't be taking Dorian's uh, wind out of the sails. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to him in just a moment here. So uh, okay. if you have any questions for, for Michael, feel free to ask. We're going to have Dorian speak next, and then we yeah. will have time at the end of the webinar to take questions for either speaker or if something comes up that you think about that you didn't think about before. So Michael, Dorian is prompting you with a question about whether you might talk a little bit about the road right of way issues. Oh, sure. It's a very good question. Uh, the, um, in, in our case on this project, um, 
here, uh, we had we had multiple sections of the road where a right of way was either not acknowledged, uh, we didn't know if it existed uh, or anything like that. And when I alluded to in the one section on 244, was actually going back to show the state agency or the, the, the entity that owns the road. Sometimes it's not the state that owns it. Sometimes it's a county, sometimes it's local. Um, and a lot of people don't know what the right of way is. And you have to go back because right of way translates to public land uh, where things can go. And a lot of roads were put in without sidewalks, without trails, without places. And uh, it's a very important part of understanding what's available to you is to understand those things. And uh, you can do that, you can go, there's uh, maps and things that you can use online for property and some different things in GIS. And you can find that, um, I'm sure you can go to uh, Department of Transportation if you needed to get maps or things like that. But uh, real important to understand, and because a lot of times, like for example, on 96, uh, the road isn't in the center of the corridor. And so as that wraps around the lake, there's a huge amount of right of way on the north side where the homes are, but we wanna be on the south side for going around the lake and it gets a little skinny. And then that's where you get into some negotiations about, you know, are you buying land from somebody which you don't obviously want to do, but sometimes you do. And um, it's just understanding what exactly is available and what's considered available, what's considered prescriptive road and what's considered, you know, there. Uh, to actually take care of or that you can use. So uh, the right away issue is, is a key one when you're looking for some way to squeeze in uh, better bike and pet facilities. Thanks for uh, speaking to that, Michael, and for the question, Dorian. So, you know, basically one of the questions as you're looking at concept designs for these projects is to look to see, you know, who owns the land. That's a key question. And we do have a follow-up question for you, Michael, that was in the chat box related to another item that needs to be considered in these different projects. And that is about snow clearance, cooperation between the city and the county for the trail system. So maintenance. So as you're scoping these projects and looking at where you're going to put this infrastructure, there's also the question about the maintenance piece. Did you want to speak to that a little bit about the snow clearance, Michael? Sure. Um, when you when you're putting in a trail like we are, uh, one of the one of the overriding questions is going to be who owns the trail, who's responsible for the trail, uh, is it the same entity that's responsible for the road? So as a nonprofit. We don't have the powers um, that an agency has, a, a community or a community or a county or something like that. And I can tell you in the Dalwood section, for example, the Dalwood is a community that is truly residential. I mean, we say if there's a shovel in Dalwood, it came in on a landscaping truck. Uh, they don't have a public works facility or anything else like that. So what we're working on now is kind of a, it could be a joint powers agreement with other communities. It could be a, a, a separate community Del, or a Matamidi next door who does it. So when it comes to doing this, that's part of the layers. That's part of the unraveling that you have to do. It's one thing to get the money. It's something else to understand uh, which agency is going to take responsibility for it because not, none of them want cost. Uh, and you have to kind of work that out. That's part of the negotiation that takes place because in, in frankness, as you know, winter maintenance, uh, there's, a, there's a road going through the center of White Bear Lake, Highway 61, that the former city manager or a former city engineer used to call a seasonal sidewalk. A lot of agencies just don't plan for it. So when you do your trails, when you do these things, that's a big consideration as to how is it going to get done and who's going to take care of it. Thanks, Michael. And that, you know, it speaks to how many people are involved in these projects, you know, and how these different folks need to work together as far as getting things done and making sure that you're considering these different nuances. We have two questions from folks in Rochester, Minnesota, Barbara Beck and Matt, um, Matthew Lynch. So I'll uh, ask Barbara's question first here, and then I think there's a, a follow-up question here as well. So how far away from a roadway do you, um, do you try to achieve? Right, so I'm interpreting that, Barbara, as being, you know, how much room do you need to put your trail in? Um, what we're trying to do, for example, on the Highway 96 side, is we're trying to get a buffer of five feet. It's about a, a 40 mile an hour road. It's about 14,000 cars per day. Uh, so we're trying to get, and I think most design manuals will back this up. You want about five feet from the road. 
and then we want a 10 foot trail. We probably could support a 12 foot trail given the amount of traffic we're gonna get, but I think we're gonna be lucky to get a 10 foot trail. So let's say 15 feet off the edge of the pavement would probably be a good number. If we can squeeze that out, that's gonna work really super well. Um, in in 2009, when I was first getting into this stuff, we were working at the north end of the lake. It, it was getting repaved. And I didn't know this was the time that most of this stuff could happen because you know all the equipment's out there. But what we thought was a big success back in 2009 was we got them to narrow the lanes a foot so we could add a foot to the shoulder. And it's still not a five foot shoulder, it's about a two foot shoulder in some places. But anyway, you wanna to try to get about 15 feet probably off the edge of the road for, for most trails along a, a fast road like that. That sounds good. And, um, you know, a follow up question about the uh, collaboration piece. So we're kind of back to that again, you know, with lots of people that are involved that need to work together to make these things happen. Michael or uh, Matthew from Rochester asks um, you to describe several collaborators in the initiative that span multiple municipalities that you mentioned that he mentioned that you were talking about that. And how are those lines of communications open to these opportunities? And lastly, what dynamics <clears throat> made for a success? collaboration so it sounds like maybe some tips to bridge those partnerships and how do you guys all work together that's what we're here for absolutely um yeah there there were a lot of of, of collaborators there's a lot of partnerships we had to deal with local communities uh we had to deal with uh, two counties we had to deal with uh, mindot met council uh lots of different people that were involved and in terms of um what we had to do to um to get those things open we started with the municipalities and we took this plan that everyone had signed off on and we went around and we got resolutions of support. So all of the city councils, here's what they want to do. Can we get a resolution of support just to show something formal and definitive that they were behind it? That was where we started. Um, the, the next thing that we had to do is we had to kind of start talking to people about, well, you know, who owns the road and, and how, where's the right of way? And, you just kind of start mixing it up a little bit with people. And that's that understanding where you're from and, and what's the problem and, and all of that. Um, so you, you kind of build on it. You, you kind of start from the beginning and you just build on it. Uh, the dynamic that made for successful uh, collaboration, I would say our legacy at Lake Links is not gonna be the trail. It's gonna be the fact that we got people to talk to one another. Um, agencies are not real good for whatever reason at solving problems between themselves. And in the implementation section of that 2000 plan that I talked about, the planners make a very big point about, yeah, everyone's got to get on the same page, but you're probably going to have a nonprofit directing traffic. You're probably going to have a nonprofit that, you know, is the little red hen, so to speak, that runs around and gets everything done and pulls people together. That's what we've been able to do. And on uh, South Shore, for example, where we got $2.4 million in 2018, we had to navigate not only a road turn back, the county said, we're not gonna own a one-way road because that's what everybody wanted. And we got through that now. And we got everyone on the page to talk about in the two, two towns of White Bear Lake and White Bear Township that, hey, this is what the public wants. This is what we need to do. Let's work this thing out. It, it happens over time and it happens in some very untraditional ways, uh, but you got to start someplace. And I would say getting a broad base of support is a really good start. Excellent. Well, Michael, thank you so much. And we are just about at noon here. And I see a few messages in the chat box just indicating that other people have meeting conflicts at noon, but definitely tune into the replay that we will post up on YouTube. And the link will be in the email that we'll send out to anyone who's on the Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Network listserv so be sure to send me an email if you'd like to join that listserv if you're not already on there and um, thanks for joining for the first half for those folks that do have to drop off for another meeting so we will continue on here My, michael gave a a wonderful segue into uh, an introduction for our second speaker today our second speaker today is going to be dorian Greeley from bike mn Dorian has worked with nonprofits as a volunteer or staff for almost 40 years, volunteering many years with the Minnesota Coalition of Bicyclists, Bike and Men's predecessor, and serving as the Bike and Men Executive Director since 2009. He worked for the Minnesota DNR from 1979 to 1996, and then served as the Executive Director of Parks and Trails Council of Minnesota from 1996 to 2008. 
Dorian currently serves on the board of the Lake Lynx, White Bear Lake Trails Association. He commuted 25 to 30 miles round trip daily for 25 years and raced for more than a decade. He and his wife, Margie, live in um, Montemidae near White Bear Lake and enjoys bicycling, Nordic skiing, sailing his ice boats, fishing, and working on his model railroad. So again, another uh, speaker on our panel today with so many things that um, precede him and in his introduction. Welcome to the webinar, Dorian. Thanks, Natalie. And, and here's, uh, uh, if I'm showing up, there's my t-shirt um, from, uh, from the Lake Lynx Association. So, um, all right. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our advocacy work uh, this spring. Uh, all of which has been virtual. Uh, talk about our legislative agenda, our day on the hill, um, and uh, the National Bike Summit and the National Bike Summit Lobby Day, uh, of, of which I am very, very involved, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So next slide. So Bike MN has been at the Capitol already, uh, and I, again, virtually. Um, and we are going to, uh, we've had a bill drafted, it's called the Omnibus Active Transportation Improvements Bill, and it'll be introduced soon. Um, it includes both policy and funding, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, we also have standalone bills uh, that are included uh, in the Omnibus Bill, but we're taking a double track to try and pass the e-bike, um, uh, rules and regulations updates from Minnesota statutes. And we have a policy bill that passed the House uh, in 2019, 122 to nothing and was not heard uh, in the Senate. So, and I see in the chat box, I don't have House file and Senate file numbers because they haven't been introduced yet. The reviser is very backed up. Uh, so the only bill I have uh, with a number is the e-bike uh, bill is House File 32, authored by Representative Elkins. So next slide, Natalie. And as you can see, uh, uh, House File 32 was heard last Thursday. And this is what a, a legislative hearing uh, looks like right now. Uh, the chair is the third person from the left in the top row. Uh, right next to me, uh, you might not recognize me because I uh, decided to stop shaving on Christmas this year uh, and haven't shaved since. Right below me is Morgan uh, Lamely. Uh, she is the policy director for People for Bikes in, in uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado. And next to her is Matt Moore. He's the general counsel for Quality Bicycle Products. Um, and right below Matt is, uh, is Connie Bernardi. Connie uh, is state representative. Connie Bernardi is going to be the chief author of uh, our omnibus bill in the house. And, uh, and then right below her, I think, is Steve Elkins. And uh, Representative Elkins is the author of House File 32. Uh, he happens to represent uh, Bloomington, uh, and the district where Quality Bicycle Products is located. Uh, so next slide. So our Omnibus Active Transportation uh, Bill uh, will include, as I said, both funding and policy. Um, so <clears throat> most of these things have been asked for, uh, have been passed by the House and or the Senate over the past couple of years. Um, so we're, we're rolling them into one big bill. Uh, and, and basically, uh, as the old saying goes, uh, throwing them at the wall like spaghetti and seeing what sticks. Um, so there has been a Metro sales tax proposed for the last couple of years for transit, biking and walking. And our bill simply, the omnibus bill is simply gonna say, if a a, a metro sales tax is authorized and passed by the legislature, 10% of it, a minimum of 10% of it should go for biking and walking. Um, to complement that in greater Minnesota, um, 
the bill also says that thou shalt spend uh, more federal money um, and MnDOT gets transportation alternatives money, um, which they can't spend on anything else or they have to turn it back to the federal government. Um, but they also have the option of spending more of their federal money on projects like transportation alternatives uh, and the legislature can order them to do that rather than just doing that. Uh, right now, MnDOT spends about 110% of their transportation alternatives allocation on transportation alternatives type projects. But uh, for example, the state of New York spends about 150%. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, for years, we've talked about a bicycling license plate and again, we just threw it in there uh, in case they say, well, it's a, it's a way for bicyclists to tax, tax themselves. Um, so uh, it's, it's an option. Uh, who knows if it'll, if it'll make it through and get put in the transportation finance bill. All these things would get rolled into the transportation finance bill. They wouldn't get passed on their own. Another is uh, the simple concept of dedicating the sales tax paid on bikes and bike parts. The problem there is that is a ded dedication of general fund revenue um, and general fund revenue uh, is, is kind of hard to come by nowadays, as you probably heard. Um, there was a deficit. Now maybe there's a, 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 a more positive revenue forecast coming out at the end of February. Um, the, the next one, the state non SNTC stands for the State Non Motorized Transportation Advisory Committee, a group convened by MnDOT. And uh, their authorization, which, which is good for 10 years, was allowed to sunset uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, we think MnDOT should have the option of formally doing that. Obviously, they're informally doing that now. Uh, the Minnesota Cycling Center is. Uh, basically some funding to do preliminary engineering on and, and, and potentially uh, uh, more planning to find a site location um, for a new velodrome. As you probably heard, the one in Blaine that's been there for the last, I don't know, a couple decades or more uh, was dismantled this summer. Last year, we, got, we asked for six million for safe routes to school in the bonding bill. And we got 3 million. So the obvious ask this year is 3 million for safe routes to school bonding to, to balance that out. Um, and uh, needless to say, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge for MnDOT to spend that kind of gear up and spend that kind of money from 1 million to 6 million, but uh, they're certainly up to the task. And our other message has been simply that if there are e-bike or I mean, if there are EV uh, electric vehicle incentives and rebates that are going to be out there, um, the same bill ought to include uh, uh, electric assist bicycles and bicycles for that matter. I don't think we should discriminate between people who uh, are totally human powered or want electric assist. So, uh, so policy funding is, or policy is the next uh, part of the active transportation uh, omnibus bill. So next slide, Natalie. And there again, we are, we're just include that uh, the riding rules update that was passed 122 to nothing by the house in 2019 and never heard by the Minnesota Senate. Um, we're gonna try a couple different strategies this year. And I said, as I said, um, uh, it's going to be a, a standalone bill as long as, as, as well as being part of the omnibus uh, bill. Uh, biking and walking goals and climate bills, uh, I think are essential. They're in there right there, in there right now. And we just want to make sure that they are. Uh, and I, as I said, update the e-bike rules and regulations to the three class system. Right now, only a class one uh, e-bike is authorized in Minnesota, which is ones that go up to 20 miles an hour with a pedal assist. 
uh, the, the, the ones that have a throttle, so you don't have to pedal, are a gray area. And the ones that uh, are pedal assisted and go up to 28 miles an hour are not defined in statute either. Um, so we're supporting that as to make it consistent with the rules um, all around the world. And the majority of states has act have actually updated uh, their state statutes to the three class system. So we want to we want to be consistent with uh, other states and other countries. The other one that uh, our our uh, back yeah the other one that our 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 safe routes to school team has has talked about and is very supportive of uh, or the safe routes network is very supportive is requiring bike walk safety training in addition to bus safety training. Right now, the law says uh, thou shalt do bus safety training, but may do bike walk training. Um, we'd like it to say uh, must do bus safety training and must do bike walk safety training. That may end up being uh, a two page sheet that gets sent home in kids' backpacks um, uh, that's, that's available on the MnDOT uh, Safe Routes to School website for, but it's, and, and it may range all the way to full implementation of Walk Bike Fund by a school. Um, so the minimum might be just that two page handout that goes home in a backpack, like the bus safety stuff. Um, but we're certainly gonna keep pushing uh, for the other end of the spectrum, which is the full implementation of Walk Bike Fund. We're also pushing for more local authority on speed limits, especially around schools. There's some, uh, uh, some issues uh, right now. Uh, the law only says you can do that on, the, a city can do that, but only on their own roads. So that's, a, that's an issue right now. So next slide, Natalie. So I hope all of you uh, will take the time, um, maybe while you're having a happy hour green beer on St. Patrick's Day, uh, to join us for a couple hours from 4.30 to 6.30. Uh, it's free. Um, and the last 30 minutes will be live Q&A with legislators. The goals here are to basically arm our advocates with the knowledge uh, and, and statewide. We wanna make sure that this is a statewide participation thing. Um, so it's obviously gonna be all online uh, and we wanna arm you with the knowledge to be more effective and talk about the big issues in Minnesota. Um, talk a little bit about the importance of uh, transportation alternatives funding too and how the state uh, needs to have, and local units of government need to have match money for that. So that's where the state funding uh, would come in that I talked about a little bit before. Um, hear from bike industry people, including uh, Morgan from People for Bikes, talking about e-bikes and, and the e-bike boom, and the, the um, Rich Tower, the uh, CEO of Quality Bicycle Products, uh, we'll talk about the bike boom and how they've been shipping as much stuff as they can get in their warehouse uh, all over the country and all over the world, but all over to bike shops all over in Minnesota. So uh, I think it's really, really important. Um, the commissioner of transportation will be there. Uh, she won't be pre-recorded. She requested specifically to be live and, and be available for questions and answers. Um, the chair of the Met Council, Charlie Zelli, the former commissioner of transportation, will record a video for us. We're going to have mayors join us. Um, and I've invited Governor Walz or Lieutenant Governor Flanagan uh, to join us. And who knows uh, if, they'll, uh, if they'll send us a video too. Um, this time we're going to have a, a, an expert from the University of Minnesota uh, it, with health professionals for a healthy climate, talk about active transportation and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, if, 
if a couple of you were on the webinar when Tony Desnick talked about images in cycling um, and showed examples from Finland uh, and showed me as a bad example of a middle-aged man in Lycra. Um, uh, but this time he's gonna reveal the big secret of how Finland and city, big cities and small cities have gone from just a couple percent mode share to 10% mode share in a little over a decade. So he's gonna share the big secrets with us on March 17th. So next slide. I also wanted to put in a plug. I see some of you are planning to attend the National Bike Summit. Um, it's uh, $60 for League of American Bicyclist members, which is a, a heck of a deal. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise it's $180. So you might as well pay your uh, 30 or 50 bucks and join the league if you're not a member already. Uh, they'll have lots of great sessions uh, that talk about communities and they are, you know, historically they've been a club organization, but they'll all, also talk about uh, a lot of things, uh, examples of like what Mike talked about uh, and, and how to get your projects done. Uh, one of the uh, keynote sessions is going to be from uh, Peter DeFazio, the chair of the House Transportation Committee. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if Pete Buttigieg makes a, a guest appearance. He's not on the agenda yet, but the last three secretaries of transportation um, have attended uh, the National Bike Summit in person. So I wouldn't be surprised if Pete, uh, 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 the Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Secretary Buttigieg, I guess I should be calling him, um, uh, joins us uh, virtually for the National Bike Summit. And the last thing I wanted to share with you is the National Bike Summit has a lobby day, um, which is the next slide, Natalie. And I have volunteered to be the state coordinator for Lobby Day and the league's goal, and this is an, probably an unattainable goal, is to have league members meet with a hundred senators uh, and all, I think it's 435 members of Congress. And they've hired a firm to set up meetings with all these, um, all these people. Inevitably, as you see in my note, it'll be, uh, a 30 minute meeting with staff and perhaps occasionally uh, a senator or representative. Um, we did get to meet, uh, we've met with Amy, uh, Senator Klobuchar a couple times in person. We did get to meet with uh, uh, Senator Franken in person uh, in the past and quite a few uh, of the members of Congress too uh, have met with us personally. But anyway, these are really, really important meetings um, because you've probably all heard that the, the transportation or the stimulus package uh, strategies are going to, it, one of them is to pass a very robust transportation uh, bill, reauthorization. And what that means is hopefully more money for transportation alternatives. Um, 50 or 100% more money for transportation alternatives, which would make a huge difference. Um, but we want to make sure that some of that federal money goes to more biking and walking safety. As you can, uh, many of you have probably heard the statistic that 1% uh, um, or 2% of the federal safety money goes for biking and walking. Um, well, uh, you know, 10 to 15, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but 10 to 15% of the fatalities and injuries are people biking and walking. So they should spend more safety money on there. Um, and we also wanna talk uh, about a national complete streets policy uh, that uh, puts some strings on the federal money uh, that goes to the states to build uh, parts of the national highway system. As many of you know, those national and state highways that are funded with federal money are very often the main street in your downtown. Um, and we wanna make sure MnDOT has the money and continues to do, and, and, and we wanna support the, the other states that aren't quite as progressive 
and that haven't done things like MnDOT has done in Glenwood, Minnesota, or uh, St. Peter, Minnesota, uh, or other places where they've rebuilt uh, the downtown streets as a complete street. So I think that's uh, my last slide. So I can answer questions and and I think we can, uh, um, I, I uh, and, and I see Matthew's comment, if South Bend is any indi indication, Secretary Buddha Judge will be a valuable participant. I think there's little doubt about the optimism um, that uh, uh, advocates are feeling about the appointment of uh, 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 Mayor Buddha Judge as Secretary of Transportation. Dorian, we have one other question here in the chat box that I want to direct to you and then um, we want to make sure if there's any other questions that people might have for you that they'd like to unmute and ask or ask um, Michael before we close the webinar today that we have that opportunity to do so. We have Steve in the chat box that, box that asked about whether there's a specific curriculum for schools for inclusion with their bus safety training. There would be. Um, the law says MnDOT shall develop and maintain it. Um, and, and basically it's a mirror of the bus safety thing. Again, MnDOT uh, maintains a, a very brief bus safety fact sheet that they send out. And uh, um, the minimum would be a, a, a bike walk safety fact sheet that MnDOT would have available. So yes, there is a, a specific curriculum for schools, um, and again, it's it's a it's a layered thing. You know, there's a minimum, and then uh, there's there's a more specific where you know they take the kids out in front of the school, they have a bus, and blah blah blah, all that kind of stuff. So, so there would be specific uh, uh, curriculum. Great, thanks, Dorian. And that's, you know, it's so important to make sure that there's something, there's a plan that's laid out. As uh, Michael had mentioned in his topic, when he was talking about uh, not just proposing that there are these these uh, problems that need to be solved, um, but also that there's a solution, you know, and how does that happen and uh, get into the details about that to present and help and work directly with those legislators to uh, make these things happen. And I did see one more question by Barbara Beck that scrolled by about if you have 30 feet of right of way, uh, you know, would it be best to put the trail further away? Um, I, you know, for the most part, the answer I think is yes. Um, but there's also design implications. Uh, there's also adjacent landowner implications uh, that are there. But for the most part, road right of ways are 66 feet or many road right of ways are 66 feet, meaning you've got 33 feet on either side of the center line of the road, uh, but there's ditches to contend with and all sorts of other things um, that you need to work out. Uh, you know, vegetation, uh, slopes, all sorts of things. But yes, if, if, if given the option, uh, yes, I think 30 feet would be a better alternative than having it immediately adjacent or even five feet from the road. Uh, five feet is pretty close to a 40 mile an hour road. Um, but as I noted uh, in the chat, um, the right of way along Highway 96 uh, and actually Minnesota 244 um, has been kind of repossessed by the adjacent landowners because they have never used it. Um, so there's there's politics here and they originally 21 years ago MnDOT said they only had a prescriptive eas easement meaning all that they owned was the road surface and the ditches that they'd been maintaining um but uh thanks to steve and mike's research uh going to the county they actually found those easements that were granted uh, some of them a very, very long time ago um, that have been evolved and transferred. But anyway, those easements, um, adverse possession, meaning if you used it and, the, and somebody hasn't used it um, for 15 years, uh, does not apply when the public owns that land. 
So adverse possession, even 50 years later, uh, does not apply in this situation. Dorian, thanks for giving so much information and so much detail. You know, it's like it's cold outside Minnesota right now, but it is heating up in the yeah. legislature. <laughs> so I do want to um, pivot to two uh, brief announcements from staff that we'd like to share with the group. I do want to recognize we do have quite a few questions queued up in the chat box. So what I'm going to do is take a couple of minutes to have Carl and Ted each present a little bit of information for maybe one to two minutes each. And then I'm going to give the floor back over to Dorian. And uh, if you need to drop off at 1230, feel free to do so. But if you'd like to continue some dialogue for a few minutes, um, we'll be here to uh, entertain those um, final questions. OK. So um, the next thing that I'd like to do here is uh, turn it over to Carl for just a moment here to share about the bikeable community workshops that maybe you have heard about. Uh, thanks, Natalie. I, I'll keep it quick here and I'll plan to send a really quick uh, follow up message with some of the information we might miss to the Bike Walk Leadership Network group chat um, after this. Uh, the big update here, if you've heard about these applications before, is that we're moving the uh, application deadline to officially be March 1st coming up in a couple weeks here. The Bikeable Community Workshops have been adapted to uh, be entirely remote this year. This is going to be conducted through two separate two-hour sessions that will be happening through Zoom, in addition to a socially distanced bike audit of your community. When I was listening to the White Bear Lake uh, conversation today, I uh, heard a lot of these conversations and connections that needed to be built. And this, where these workshops can be a great opportunity to jumpstart some of those conversations with bike champions, uh, local engineers, local elected officials, uh, in conversations that are guided by our experts from Bike Amen, MinDOT, and MDH in these workshops as well. Um, look for a quick message with some links to application in our planning guide following this webinar in the group chat, but uh, hope, hoping to hear some more from you, some of you soon and get some conversation started. I just had a really, yeah, you want to highlight the two virtual two hour sessions uh, and how you're going to make that happen, Carl. Uh, sure thing. So these, uh, we have some flexibility on our end. So we uh, are planning to have these workshops conducted. Our agenda allows for two hour sessions because we all have uh, some amount of Zoom fatigue. These uh, sessions can either be two days in the same week, two uh, days on the same day of the week, back to back or et cetera for what might work best for your local community. In, in addition, where you do have one day that is gonna be on your own time out on your bicycle in your community, doing some evaluation of some of the topics we'll be covering as well. Thanks. That's awesome. Thanks for uh, providing that additional uh, piece, Carl, and for joining us again for a second month in a row to give more detail on the Bikeable Community Workshop. So stay tuned, click on the links, apply and participate in these. These are really excellent workshops that will help launch you into new projects. So the next uh, piece here is, uh, about winter trivia, and I'm gonna uh, give the floor over to Ted. Ted, welcome to the webinar. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we've had a really good time with this. Um, and uh, happy Black History Month, everybody. That's what we're in the midst of right now. So that's why uh, this month's trivia um, was focused on uh, Black bicycle history, which is way more than Major Taylor. So if you, uh, even though, if you missed it, if you email me, ted at bikemn.org, I'll get you those slides, lots of cool stuff there. But you can still join us uh, in March. Um, it's at 6.30 p.m. to 7.30, it's free, lots of cool prizes, um, and it's been a really good time. So um, I think I threw the Eventbrite uh, registration in there, that'll get you the Zoom link and stuff like that too. And then, um, yeah, we're really, really excited about this um, and our partnership um, with Our Streets Minneapolis um, to bring back uh, the Bicycle Film Festival. Um, so it's a great way to support Bike MN and see some really, really cool Films and the thing uh, we're most excited about is um, Maya um, was able, one of our staff was able to put together a really great panel of the folks you see here uh, to kind of talk about some of the intersections of uh, race and bicycling, um, equity and, and everything surrounding that. So it's a really good discussion. That's a part of that that you get in addition uh, to some uh, international films. Um, if you've never seen the Bicycle Film Festival before, um, this is a really good deal. I think you, you can 
it's kind of a pay what you can, but I think as low as 10 bucks, um, you can get uh, streaming and, and you can watch it um, over a larger period of time too that fits with your schedule. So um, definitely check that out too. Thanks, Ted. You know, there's always a lot going on here and opportunities for you to plug in in different ways as an advocate or educator. And, you know, we just want to make sure that uh, we give you these opportunities to share with them with you. And um, it's it's been an excellent webinar with lots of information. Uh, hopefully your head isn't spinning too much. I see there's quite a few questions uh, again in the chat box that we'll, we'll circle back to here in just a moment. But I do wanna thank everyone that's been on the webinar today for participating, asking questions, listening in intently to the details that have been presented to you. Uh, feel free to pay attention to links in the chat box and reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions. So if you do need to drop off here at 1230, um, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn the floor back over to Dorian here to take a few of these additional questions and um, just uh, share one last piece of information with you that uh, is a reminder. Dorian, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, um, thanks for that question, Michelle. Uh, there is some movement around e-bike tax credits and bike tax credits, uh, and those came as recommendations from MnDOT's Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, or Advisory Council. Um, so yes, uh, and yes, there are there is an e-bike uh, tax credit bill at the federal level too. Uh, so we'll keep watching that. Um, the, and Ian's question about the three foot passing law, uh, there has been not, there has not been much promotion of that, but it is included as one of the uh, uh, rotating questions on the Minnesota driver's exam. Um, so it is taught in driver education, um, but I couldn't agree more that there needs to be uh, a public relations campaign and a promotion about that. And, uh, you know, that's potentially something that we could do if there was more funding available. That's something we could do with the uh, Metro sales tax money um, and certainly can be advocated for at the Met Council and MnDOT. Excellent. We're trying, I'm trying to scroll back through to make sure we're not missing any questions. There was a lot of them and it kept rolling through. I want to just uh, show you on the screen here. Um, you know, this is just a, the staff and a picture we took at the Bike Summit last year in St. Paul, which seems like uh, ages ago, but uh, there we were all in person uh, without masks on at the summit. But of course, we're in a little different environment this year. So the see you there will be virtual, as Dorian mentioned, and um, we'd love for any participation. It looks like quite a few people were planning to attend, which is excellent. So, you know, the opportunity for the state summit for Minnesota and to connect through Dorian with the national summit. Um, in DC in the lobby day, you know, uh, excellent opportunity. So hopefully you have some information you've received today that helps you be feel a little more prepared to attend these events. And if you don't feel like you're quite there, please reach out, we'll help you get prepared so that you can participate. You may have saw that I actually had a tie on last Thursday. And I think that might've been the first time I had a tie on since this picture was taken a year ago. <laughs> Very good. Well, I'll just hold the, the uh, space for just a moment here. If there's anyone else that's on the webinar that would like to ask a question of Doreen or, um, you know, we'll queue it up for Michael. I believe he had to drop off the line because we are running past time, just a couple of minutes, but there's been so many excellent questions and we want to make sure you feel prepared for the uh, Minnesota Bike Walk Summit or the National Summit and that you have this opportunity to ask questions if you have them. So does anyone else that's on the line here have a question for Dorian or, um, uh, the staff about anything that we've shared today? I sure hope you can all join us for the Minnesota Summit. Um, you know, we, I, we kept it short, kept it at a convenient time. Uh, and I think you'll have a, a lot of valuable firsthand information. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining. On March 17th, it's gonna be a big day and we'll have our March Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Webinar. And we will also have, as we've been mentioning here, the Minnesota Bike Walk Summit. So it's, it'll be a busy day on March 17th, but we hope that you'll join us for both and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, everybody.